Hi, this is Mark Sobel. I'm the U.S. Chair of OMFIF. Today, I am delighted to be joined by Scott Kennedy, Bob Doner, and Menzi Chen. Scott is the is one of America's most prominent China scholars. He's a senior advisor and trustee chair in Chinese business and economics at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, which is a leading Washington uh, think tank. Bob, a longtime colleague of mine at the Treasury Department, he was Treasury's representative in Japan for a long time. He was Treasury's Mr. Asia for a long time. And he was also the chief economist on the international side, kind of the best macroeconomist in the international department. Menzi Chen, longtime professor at the University of Wisconsin. I think I met him when he was at CEA, when we were both much younger. Uh, he's a leading scholar on international monetary and global economic issues. And uh, for everybody in the audience, I'd recommend his blog, Econo Browser. So today's rec discussion is on the record. There's a chat function to submit questions. Um, I'm going to open the floor uh, to each of our panelists for to share some thoughts. I'll engage with them and some questions, and then we'll open it to the floor. So we're going to be discussing today U.S.-China tensions, the role of the dollar, the implications for the U.S. and Chinese roles in the global order. Um, that's a mouthful. Who better to lead us off than Scott Kennedy? Uh, good morning. Um, I just want to double check. Everybody can hear me fine. Ready to go. Super. Great. Uh, Mark, uh, thank you and Omfi for having me uh, participate in today's uh, conversation. Um, about U.S.-China relations, um, I uh, eat, drink, sleep uh, U.S.-China relations, um, which is uh, recently not a very good meal, so I'm not in very good shape, and hopefully this is part of the recovery process uh, to deal with them. And I was asked to talk about the origins of the broader tensions, um, evolution of Trump policies, and some of my concerns with the dominant uh, policy framework that seems to be uh, in DC, which is the idea of decoupling. And I'm going to hand things over to my colleagues to uh, provide the answers to the problems that I raise. Uh, the first, uh, the, the origins of the broader tensions. Uh, uh, on the China side, uh, economic success uh, like we've never seen. Uh, you know, China's grown faster, longer than anyone. Uh, continental size economy. Uh, using um, methods that um, weren't approved, uh, but they didn't face a whole lot of pushback at the very beginning uh, of their time in the WTO and even beyond uh, that early honeymoon phase. Uh, they also saw U.S. and their Western problems with the global financial crisis, uh, which shook their faith in free markets. Uh, they saw the Snowden affair, which confirmed that the U.S. was two-faced, uh, and so they lost faith in faith in integration and trusting the U.S. Uh, and all of that uh, then, trend, and then you get Xi Jinping uh, coming into power in 2012. He is both symptom and cause, uh, symptom of, of those uh, other trends, cause because he has taken China's, uh, you know, auto speeding toward modernization and pressed on the gas in a hard right uh, authoritarian direction, uh, as little uh, he has opposition at home, but he's been able to uh, put them out, get them out of the way. Uh, and so, across, you know, if Chinese Chinese people don't have middle names, but if they did, his would be control. Uh, and you know, the problems that we face are similar to, you know, explained how he deals with domestic issues. It explains Hong Kong, a, l a lot of things. Uh, so China is a genuine challenge. On the U.S. side, uh, we've had a whole variety of dysfunction for a long time: economic inequality, political partisanship. Uh, declining social trust, you may have noticed, um, and that's made a challenge for us to deal with all sorts of types of, of problems, which make the China challenge look bigger. Second challenge, uh, I'm going to blame Bob and Mark. Uh, Bob and Mark were in government uh, for a while uh, b before Trump, and I'm not, I'm not really blaming them. What I'm saying is, is that we didn't have the best response that we could have towards China originally, as it was, as it's been more powerful. It's not their fault. Uh, but I, I do think that uh, the U.S. has generally had a difficult time adapting to China's rise and figuring out what to do. Uh, also blame uh, Europe. Europe was not willing to adapt very quickly either. Um, 
And then I'll say, uh, before I get to Trump bashing, uh, which everyone is a, is a sport, it's easy, it's a low, low hanging fruit. Uh, we didn't get TPP over the line to Trans-Pacific Partnership. And I think if we had gotten TPP over the line, we'd be talking a whole different game right now. Uh, and I, I really can't state how significant uh, that was. And, you know, Trump just, he put the last nail in the coffin as opposed to really sunk it to begin with. In terms of the evolution of Trump's policies, uh, I think there's been three phases. The first six months of the Trump administration, uh, bilateral negotiation. You may remember the Mar-a-Lago cake summit uh, where uh, the granddaughter of President uh, Trump uh, serenaded uh, Xi Jinping and his wife. Uh, nice music uh, didn't solve anything. They had a, a, a meeting, comprehensive economic dialogue meeting, July of 2017, got nowhere. Um, then uh, with uh, failure in that path, they tried, they switched to unilateral pressure. Uh, U.S. Trade Representative Bob Lighthizer had come into, uh, uh, was appointed, uh, got his pencils sharpened, and in August 2017 launched um, uh, 301 investigation. Uh, that was uh, then followed up by several rounds of, of tariffs uh, as a design, as an, in an effort to get China to scream uncle and uh, give in on uh, all the things that they'd done wrong uh, and uh, make massive changes to their overall economic model. Well, that effort really broke down in April, May of 2019, when the Chinese essentially backed up from some offers. If you look at this great new book that's out, uh, superpower showdown. It, it it lays out in detail th how the those negotiations broke down. Both sides essentially uh, accused the other of negotiating in bad faith. And I think both sides were right. Uh, so they didn't uh, uh, about they were right about the other, uh, and they also didn't understand the other side very well. In any case, uh, from that point on, uh, this effort to change China is gradually given way to a new policy, uh, which I I'll just call. Someone may have heard of this word before, containment. The American goal now is to uh, weaken China and isolate China. I think that's the dominant view. And that began when those negotiations broke down uh, in April 29. We saw actions against Huawei. Uh, but I think it really picked up speed and solidified with the pandemic. I think the pandemic, you can't underestimate how big an effect it had on the Trump administration's thinking about China and what to do. Partly out for, from the president's point of view, he had to turn hard on China uh, as a campaign strategy mm -hmm. from the perspective of those who in the administration who actually have foreign policy ideas and intellectual foundation to what they do. Uh, this just proved that there was no changing China. And so we went from originally a policy that the supposed globalists in the administration would have supported uh, through uh, a, a period when Lighthizer's view of pushing hard on China to get change dominated to now uh, Navarro. Uh, and he, he basically is now the middle of the Trump administration's policies on China. And that's why uh, the comments he made the other night on Fox News were so revealing. Well, what reveals, of course, first, they don't have uh, ability to manage their message. But what it does show is that he wasn't paying attention to the question. He was just revealing that, th that there's no way uh, in their mind to manage the relationship, it's fully broken. And so that's the strategy. The phase one deal is basically a legacy of the previous phase of the of the policy, and they can't get rid of it. They don't want to junk it, uh, which is why the president said what he said uh, in his tweets. Uh, lastly, and I'm sorry to have droned on for a long time, my concern with uh, Washington's obsession with decoupling, which now dominates the conversation. It's there's no, should we decouple or not decouple? It's, should we decouple fully? Should we partially decouple? Should we decouple here or there? Because it's this view uh, that uh, integration, interdependence doesn't create common bonds and, and uh, grow our economy and reduce risks. It's that it generates vulnerabilities, which we have to eliminate as much as possible. Uh, and, and that's because, you know, she, uh, Ch Trump, uh, and, and that view of that fear of the world now dominates and pervades Washington. And it's got its cousin in Beijing in Xi Jinping, same uh, outlook, broadly speaking. Uh, and so that's why we've seen all these actions on Huawei, um, efforts to extradite their uh, the senior executive uh, now in Canada, deny them markets for their products in the West, uh, deny them components into their products so they can't function. 
Uh, but, we, but we've seen that across a whole variety of technologies. And if left to their own devices, we will see a lot of these uh, steps continue. But there's some problems. And let me just point to a couple of them uh, that exist. You can't control the type of decoupling that you want. Uh, you, you could decouple the US and China, and you could isolate China or bifurcate the world. That's, those are two possible outcomes. But just as likely, and probably more likely, if uh, we continue along this path, is that the US and China would pull apart, but we'd end up with a much more fragmented world. Or the US would be isolated. Secondly, uh, and this goes uh, just further along, uh, the US, uh, as it continues down this path, is probably going to decouple itself from the West. Uh, because European companies, Japanese companies, everyone else, they're not leaving China. They are modifying supply chains, managing risk, uh, building in redundancies, but they're not leaving China. Uh, survey after survey shows China, uh, European, uh, Asian companies are staying, in fact, investing more in China. In addition, Washington to decouple itself from the United States because the rest, because American companies are also not leaving uh, at the same rate. Um, second issue, uh, economic costs. The economic costs of pulling up stakes from China are expensive. Uh, and the other economic outcomes would also be costly. It's 10 billion bucks to build a fab, a semiconductor plant. You take one from Asia, you plop it down in Arizona or some other place, that's $10 billion to begin with. Then you add on other, other costs. You got to find people to work in those factories. Add that up for many others. There's a great article in The Economist came out uh, today on face masks and why are face masks in China and why is it difficult to move them elsewhere. Second cost, national security risks. Everyone thinks decoupling will make you safer. Actually, it raises a whole variety of national security costs. It means you don't have those common bonds to work with each other, to, to uh, raise the costs of, of, of uh, war, um, and you'd lose that. Uh, in addition, uh, we're able to have China involved in our innovation networks because we are coupled. That means they are in our ecosystem, dependent on our technology, and we can monitor them. We also have uh, how many hundreds of thousands of Chinese students and people who stay here to work, helping us innovate and stay ahead. Um, and then um, that's the same for our allies in Europe and in Asia, um, Taiwan in particular. Ta China has not attacked Taiwan in part because it depends on Taiwan so much for high tech. So um, there's a lot of bad reasons uh, why we shouldn't just simply uh, decouple outright. Uh, what are the final alternatives? What are the alternatives finally? Uh, well, we're not going back to unconditional engagement. Uh, that's just uh, 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 impossible. So we're gonna have to come up with some type of conditional engagement, something I call principled interdependence, if we're gonna find an alternative decoupling, which is about uh, managing the risks while uh, of in, in engaging with China while also building uh, the risk mitigation mechanisms and systems within the US and between the US and all of its friends. Um, there's a whole variety of things that we can do there. Very difficult, uh, and it's the moder moderate middle path, which may may means it's very unlikely the US is going to choose that uh, in, the, in the near term. So let me stop there. Sorry for, for going on so long. Uh, look forward to the rest of the conversation. Great. Very great observations. Uh, Mr. Donor. Okay, thanks very much, Mark, and thanks to OMFIF. I'm going to start with a macroeconomic outlook. Um, because I think this is an episode in which the relative economic standing and the relative power of China is gonna take a quantum step up, just like it did over the period of the global financial crisis. Uh, the IMF just issued its revised global economic outlook for 2020. Uh, they dropped the global forecast from minus three to minus 4.9. They dropped the U.S. forecast from minus six to uh, minus eight, and they dropped the Chinese economic forecast from plus 1.2 to plus 1.0. Um, this is a period of extraordinary uh, uh, macro impact, but also extraordinary uncertainty. I think for reasons that Scott has, has kind of hinted at, 
the Chinese Chinese system, the Chinese economy is better able to cope with a situation that requires large scale social mobilization than the United States or many other industrialized countries are. Uh, the United States took its shot at disease containment. We were politically divided, too eager to uh, exit containment. And you're beginning to see a rise in cases, not just in the United States, but also in many, many European countries. Um, let me sketch three uncertainties. Uh, the first is the virus itself. Uh, it now looks like the reduction in cases, the reduction in death, basically the trajectory of the virus is going to be higher and longer for much more than we first anticipated or hoped. Uh, the second uncertainty is really consumer behavior. Uh, as lockdown, as policy fades, it's really the extent to which people are comfortable going back to a variety of services that basically requires them to be in rooms or in vessels, concert halls, uh, airliners, uh, restaurants. And the extent to which consumers are confident depends on the degree to which, the extent to which businesses are able to adapt the extent to which they're able to reassure their customers of the safety of, of using those services, but it also depends on the trajectory of the cases itself. It's gonna be hard to convince people to go back to spending uh, when the caseload and deaths are rising. And the last thing that I'll point out is that um, we're about to enter a real period of stimulus fatigue and stimulus fading in the United States and a number of European countries. And extraordinarily how long we've been able to avoid austerity this time, but we won't forever. And as the stimulus payments fade, as supplemental unemployment insurance runs out at the end of July, and as the end of credit forbearance uh, comes for a lot of firms and households, we're gonna find that a lot of firms and households that were being held above the waterline by stimulus are now gonna sink as it's, as it's withdrawn. Um, the, we have a reasonable sense, I think, of how the Chinese economy will do through this period. They're not gonna do great, but they're going to do significantly less badly than the rest of the world, and by quite a bit less badly than the United States. Um, let me turn to trade issues. Um, as the Asia guy, I guess I take the at Treasury. I guess I take the fall for uh, for past approaches to uh, the, the Chinese government to Chinese trade issues. Um, it is true that at the end of the Obama administration, there was a real darkening of the relationship with China. And there was a view coming into the next administration in 2016, whatever it was, it was going to have to take a much tougher reset line towards China. The Trump administration had a real opportunity and there were real issues in the US-China relation. I guess for me, the way that I see them were first, industrial policy and subsidies, domestic subsidies designed to develop leading industries. And the second was a variety of technology acquisition policies, ranging from forced technology transfer to commercial espionage. These were the policies that were outlined in the USDR 301 report. And I think the Trump administration might have had a chance to make real progress on these issues, real initial progress on these issues. And that would have changed the trajectory of, of US-China relations, certainly on the economic side. Um, instead, uh, the Trump administration chose what we used to call the Boeing card. I guess we should now call it the Cargill card, uh, opting for big purchases rather than for dealing with the structural issues, pushing them off to a phase two uh, negotiation. Um, the question that I get asked a lot is, is phase one dead? Uh, will the United States walk away from phase one? And the answer to that is no. Phase one is the sum total 
of all the Trump administration was able to accomplish in three and a half years in dealing with China. Um, in particular, American farmers, a critical constituency of, of Trump's going into the election, suffered the pain of the negotiation and, and conflict strategy and lost a good part of a major market to Brazil and also to Chinese self-sufficiency. Um, I find the question, will China meet the phase one target, uninteresting. Almost certainly not, they won't meet the targets. But by election day in the United States, we will have trade data through August 2020, i.e. for only two thirds of the year. Coronavirus in the first half of the year, you can imagine that one or two good summer months of trade data, maybe a big purchase announcement in September would make a huge difference or maybe they won't be there. Um, I think uh, the phase one deal is an albatross that the Trump administration has to shoulder. And uh, the initiative is on the Chinese side, not on the US side. In contrast to phase one, which lives on like a zombie, phase two is dead. Uh, it's a victim of US-China tensions and also of the developing uh, trade uh, technology war. Um, if there was a chance to address the critical structural issues in the relationship at the beginning of the Trump administration, that's gone now. And while I had one thing to what Scott mentioned, I think the, the view of, of the incoming Trump officials, uh, like any new administration, was all of your predecessors are idiots. Um, you know, they expected China to become exactly like the United States. Um, the administration, I think, has moved from a view that a tougher, more direct administration with real economic leverage can negotiate real agreements with China to a view of the defense hawks that China is implacable, China's behavior can't be changed. It can only be confronted, contained, or blocked in various activities. And I think what's ironic about this is that we have in fact ch changed China. We've strengthened the position of the hawks in the Chinese government, the ones most opposed to any kind of engagement with the United States, essentially making a mirror image of ourselves in the Chinese government. I don't think this had to happen, but I think it's gonna be very difficult to reverse. Well, thank you uh, for that. Um, uh, one quick observation just on the comment that the Chinese forecast is unchanged and that um, China is doing less badly. Um, obviously, they it appears they've handled the virus far better, but um, there there is a critique that China uh, can pump out the credit allocation and uh, sustain any given growth rate uh what if it's willing to build up the leverage in the system and that doesn't mean it's efficient growth it's yeah. but it is numerical growth but we may perhaps come back to that let me turn the floor over to menzi chen great uh, thank you so much for inviting me to this incredible uh, panel uh, i think i've learned a lot uh, as i tell my students i warn them all the time uh, i'm an international macro person who by chance happens to deal with China because, well, you can't avoid China when you're talking about the global economy. So in that context, let me talk about things I, I feel I know something about, sort of observables. And uh, the observables are sometimes the things that people ask the most about. So let me deal with first, um, you know, is, is China uh, in these times challenging America in the financial sector in terms of being the dominant international currency? Uh, is China uh, essentially able to threaten the U.S. by virtue of its vast holdings of, of treasury debt and so forth? Um, these sort of questions about, you know, will they continue to invest in the U.S. Uh, in terms of uh, portfolio securities or capital flows, but also more narrowly, uh, foreign direct investment? These are things that I get asked about. I can I can point to what's happened over the past few months, past couple of years. Uh, because we have some data on these things, 
Uh, other things, of course, uh, as Bob mentioned earlier, we, we won't know, for instance, the full outcome of the coronavirus crisis on trade uh, and, and holdings of treasuries, for instance, until a few months down the line. So there we have to think about, you know, what are intentions. But on the issues of where China stands in terms of its currency, it's interesting to think about how, despite the massive shocks we've had, um, so if you think about uh, President Trump saying he'd like to cancel the debt we owe to China, you know, in olden times, I mean, by olden times, I mean, pre-2016, we would have spent weeks and weeks and weeks talking about the implications of that. And yet that was something that came and went possibly because it was viewed as just completely implausible, uh, that threat came and went within a day or two in the news cycle. Um, what about Hong Kong? Uh, you know, the, the very fact that we had these new measures which essentially allow China to have complete control uh, if it goes through over what happens in Hong Kong despite the promises made in 1997, um, that too has not had an impact on financial markets. So I'm really surprised by the amount of seeming, you know, stress that, seeming stability there is uh, in various financial relationships uh, between US and China. Um, let me talk about, for instance, the role of uh, the dollar versus um, the Chinese currency, the renminbi, in global markets, because that's something that people talk about all the time. Um, the uh, you know, if you look at where the dollar stands as a reserve currency, its use in international financial transactions, its use in invoicing of international trade, uh, not much has happened over the past couple of years. If you look over the last 15 years, for instance, and you try to look at things like how much of international reserves held around the world is held in dollars, um, there's been fluctuation, but by and large, we're not within a few percentage points uh, for dollar roll where it was 15 years ago. And I think that stability represents the fact that the things that we've identified in the academic literature for what matters for a dominant reserve currency uh, haven't changed much thus far. And those things are things like, well, economic size, well, China's grown a lot there, but also financial depth, how liquid are your markets? How large are your uh, financial markets? And you might say, well, that must have changed a lot. But what matters are sort of financial markets that are active and active uh, both domestically and internationally. That depends upon uh, the faith of international investors, broadly speaking, uh, being willing to save uh, or put their assets in the form of a particular currency. and Thus far, despite I'd say the best uh, uh, the best uh, attempts of the Trump administration, people still retain the faith that you can put your money in treasury assets or dollar assets more generally, and be reasonably secure with the thought that your your assets won't be expropriated. Um, now, how long will that last? That's one of those things where you know markets seemingly uh, can can change their opinions pretty quickly. But thus far, uh, it's, a, it's a race where people think that dollar assets are safer than, for sure, Chinese uh, assets dominated in Chinese currency and as well in other currencies to a lesser extent. So, so one of those things that's a common question, you know, is China's currency becoming a dominant one? Maybe along some dimensions like invoicing that are related to trade and maybe the, the, the Chinese would, in the longer term, like to have um, the Chinese currency in principle more international, quote unquote, perhaps for prestige reasons. Um, you, it's, you're hard pressed to see a big shift there. Uh, what about the Chinese holding treasury debt? Well, uh, what are the implications of that? Uh, they have massive holdings shrinking over time uh, relative to total. Um, is there a threat to? the U.S. from them dumping it, well, as we've often said, you know, what would be the interest of the Chinese in doing that? And so that's always seemed to me an empty threat. Um, there's no profit to it. Um, so to the extent that that continues, uh, we're, we're pretty stable there. 
Um, what about other things like foreign direct investment? They're actually predating the COVID crisis. We had a, a sharp drop off. And so you can see from tens of billions of dollars worth of foreign direct investment per year um, up through about 2016, 2017, we've dropped to essentially on net gross flows as far as we can tell, as far as we can measure, of foreign direct investment in the US from China, it's essentially zero. So there are some things that have changed, um, whether that's the central issue and whether that's durable, uh, you might say that perhaps the Chinese are just waiting for what's going to happen in terms of the next administration. Um, but you know that's one of the few areas where we can detect a big change in terms of the observables. So when I look at the uh, landscape of sort of global financial relations, it's surprising to me, given the shocks that have hit it, how much has remained the same. Uh, in terms of trade, I think I should probably defer to the others who are here who have a better feeling for both the politics in Washington, D.C and what are the sort of thoughts within China about how to approach um, trade relations with the U.S. Um, you know, if we talk about the issues about, for instance, reshoring economic activities from China to the U.S. or in some way inducing activities that, you know, production from China to some other, quote unquote, more uh, friendly places, let's say, I guess, Vietnam or less threatening, I should say, um, there, it's hard to see the actual hard data um, that validates that we've actually undertook uh, some sort of onshoring or reshoring of activities. Uh, that doesn't mean that it can't happen in the future, especially in the wake of the issues of, um, you know, do we have a secure uh, supply chain for pharmaceuticals, for medical equipment, and so forth. But so far, I haven't seen actual concrete moves uh, to implement to actually put into place the policies that would uh, spur these activities, uh, except to the extent that uh, the Trump administration has sort of heightened the uncertainty of trade relations with China. And that can be a very powerful inducement uh, to private firms to either stop further investment in China in plants and, and uh, manufacturing capacity, um, uh, something along those lines. So it's an indirect policy in a way and may be the most effective. Um, but that seems to me an open question whether that is effective and whether um, any such uh, intention persists into the next administration. I, I think I've probably gone on long enough about these imponderables, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you for that. Um, well, let me just throw out a question to just kick things off, and I'm going to throw out a grab bag of questions since we're running uh, past uh, time. But uh, thanks for the great comments. Um, so, in the, in in the first round, um, first of all, if you heard anything from each other uh, that you object to or thought was really profound, uh, I'd like to hear it. Um, and then, uh, how much is this affecting? the um, America's global standing and how much ch China's global standing? What's that situation? And then uh, we're already, I had a question and we're beginning to get questions in from the audience about, um, can we get back to constructive engagement? Can we work together with China? Um, where are areas, um, you know, could the US instead of, uh, complaining, a uh, table, a list of reforms which China uh, might undertake that could get us back to a, a better place. Um, so, so why don't I stop there and um, open the floor. Should I stick with the same order I had before and uh, give Scott a minute on uh, these points? Um, sure. I, I don't disagree with anything Bob or Menzi has said. Um, I think Bob said essentially that um, the U.S. has tried to adapt uh, for a while, um, and it's it's challenging to adapt to uh, a, a country like China, which is going through a historic uh, growth. Uh, and um, you know, the pandemic is actually going to translate macroeconomically into China coming out of this better. It's going to make it even more difficult for the U.S. to adapt. Uh, and I think what Menzi is, is essentially saying is that. It looks like a whole lot of stuff is happening in trade and finance, 
Uh, but the global reality is that not as much has changed as people think. I guess I would say on the on the latter point, uh, we have to still pay attention to what goes on inside the Beltway, uh, because uh, the policies do matter. They are affecting uh, what companies are deciding to do in terms of future investments, even if they're not running for China, running from China. Uh, the announcement that um, TSMC, the Taiwanese chip uh, uh, contractor, is going to build a plant in Arizona is going to be followed up by another other announcements. Uh, and I think that these things are going to change. Uh, some uh, have some effect on supply chains and things like that. And short-term policies can have long-term effects if they're uh, imposed for a while. So I, I still think um, we ought not to be too complacent that this is just a DC storm that is just passing through. Um, I'd say in terms of what to do with China, man, we've given China so many lists. Uh, when, 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 when you and Bob were in government, I can't, I'm sure you had some very long lists as, as sure. well. So it, it's not that China uh, doesn't know what the U.S. and others want. No. It's that they don't agree. Uh, and it's interesting in my conversations the last few months uh, with Chinese uh, about these issues, and, and maybe going back a little bit further, sort of three kinds of responses I get. The one is, this is all your fault. Trump is crazy. Um, we were talking through things uh, in a moderate way, and you guys have just gone off the rails. Then I hear the other comment, which isn't quite so bad uh, about Trump, but is saying, you know what? What we're doing works. Uh, you may not like it, and it may be different than what we promised, but it works. So tough. That's essentially what they're saying. They're not saying tough, but that's what they mean. It's just, just it, you may find it unfair, but, but live with it. The third is from Chinese liberals who are utterly uh, upset uh, and despondent over what's going on in China, but they're equally despondent over what's going on in Washington. Uh, so either any of those three reactions I get from Chinese are basically fatalistic that the ship has sailed and there's not much that people can do. Uh, my goal uh, is to try and remind people that People control this, that we're not just cogs in a giant machine, and that new policies and efforts can shift things. Uh, so I'm deeply worried. Uh, but if I if I didn't have any faith, I would have stayed at a Big Ten university in the Midwest and hung out more with Menzi uh, instead of come to Washington. And I don't want to go back, even though I really love Bloomington, Indiana, and the Midwest. I want to stay in D.C. and hopefully uh, make something of, of the time here. Okay, so I'll make uh, three quick reactions. Slash Actually, point. Bob, can I interrupt you for 10 oh, seconds? Course, yeah. Which is, um, yeah. uh, since um, Menzi dealt a lot with the international monetary issues, but uh, you had a little bit of background in this. Uh, uh, as we carry on, could if you're able to just think through the question about um, U.S. sanctioning Hong Kong and what that might mean for kind of these global monetary issues. You don't have to answer that. Minzy can ask or, or vice versa, but I throw it out there for all of you to think about as you carry on. Okay, maybe four quick reactions. Uh, the first is that the Trump administration announces a lot of things that it's going to do and does very few of them. Uh, maybe some of you remember the directive to all US companies operating in China to hear forth, bring their operations back to the United States. Uh, you know, the United States has a, announced a lot of, of potential sanctions, but has not taken action on any of them so far, uh, including the sanctions on Hong Kong, although these are, are potential in the future. Um, and in fact, the sanctions that are announced are relatively mild with the exception of the uh, threat to delist Chinese companies from, from US stock exchanges. And I guess I'm gonna to have to talk a little bit about this because this was an issue that I was negotiating with China on 10 years ago. Uh, as a result of the Enron accounting scandals, dot-com bubble, Sarbanes-Oxley, um, the public company accounting oversight board was required to supervise and investigate the accounting uh, 
of registered U.S. companies for all companies listed on the U.S. Stock Exchange. Um, that's true now for all global companies listed on the U.S. exchanges, with one exception, and the exception is China. Uh, there are 188 Chinese companies listed on U.S. exchanges. Total capitalization is $1.9 trillion, so it's a big deal. Uh, the top 10 are $1.4 trillion. Um, the bill hasn't passed yet. It's likely to pass, I think. But even if it does, it will give Chinese companies, China, three years to come into compliance or be delisted. And for a country's ability to enforce its own rules on its own exchange listing after a period of 15 years seems to me like a reasonable, reasonable threat. Uh, the second point is on uh, the status of the US dollar. Um, Lots of people look at reserves. I look at transactions and where money flows go. Uh, roughly 70% of global trade is financed in dollars. Uh, even higher percentage of bond, stock, uh, other transactions. Um, multilateralism has suffered a great deal in the current crisis, but the one institution that has really stepped up is the US Federal Reserve by reactivating and expanding swap lines for US dollars, for also offering uh, repo facilities for any central bank or that holds US treasuries to convert treasuries into dollar liquidity. The Fed has assured the world for the second time running that if you hold dollar assets, you have access to dollar liquidity. And therefore US assets U.S. transactions, U.S. financial obligations are a relatively safe thing to hold. Um, the third point is um, we are entering a period of localization and decoupling. Um, I think Scott is absolutely right. This doesn't give you increased security. Um, in fact, uh, the problem during the current crisis with uh, the supplies of pharmaceuticals, of respirators, face masks, and other personal protective equipment was not that we were dependent on China. It was that demand for these materials increased by a factor of about 17 in a matter of a month. And the US hospitals, US government, as a lot of countries did, let their stockpiles of these uh, equipment run down, it wouldn't have mattered where the stuff was produced. Um, and imposing export controls would have only given you a little bit of, of respite. Uh, basically, trade makes the, the globe safer because surges in one area can be responded to by production in another area. Just like we have electricity on a wheeled grid so that a uh, you know an extraordinary heat wave in the northeast or the failure of a power plant is met by supplies from other parts of the country, uh, requiring each locality in the United States to be self-sufficient electricity would provide neither efficiency nor nor security. And so, stop there. Thank you. And um, just uh, your presentation reminded me that you wrote an OMFIF commentary, which you can find on the OMFIF webpage probably a month ago uh, or so. And you wrote that, if I recall correctly, that while people may question whether the United States is still the indispensable nation, uh, nobody questions that the Fed is the world's indispensable central bank. Menzi, please. Uh, thanks. Uh, this is all really important uh, material, and and the one thing I want to to um, focus in on, I guess, is the fact that as we're focusing in on the policies that are likely persist over time, it seems to me the one thing where there seems to be agreement within the belt beltway, uh, as far as I can tell from this distance in the Midwest, is n national security concerns. So should we have a change in the party controlling the White House? and Congress uh, in a few months. Um, what seems to be enduring, as far as I can tell, is 
uh, we are concerned about uh, the um, national security implications narrowly defined of uh, having China deeply involved in supply chains, particularly with respect to um, uh, you know, production of semiconductor chips and, and things related to um, information and communications technologies. Um, so that certainly seems to me a big, big change in the landscape, certainly in terms of the degree to which we're pursuing visibly uh, efforts to, to de-link and decouple from the Chinese economy. Now, more generally, I wonder what's going to happen, like all of you, uh, because up until the onset of the uh, COVID crisis, uh, what was true is that Mr. Trump had done something that I hadn't thought was possible, which was to make freer trade or relatively free trade pretty popular, at least as far as we could tell in, in polling uh, of the public. And so, you know, the sort of trade war that was launched that didn't seem to go very far in terms of reducing our trade balance and causing lots of uncertainty seemed to essentially demonstrate that, well, uh, maybe there are benefits to uh, greater linkages internationally. Now, the question I have is, past the COVID crisis, where people associate domestic production of, let's say, PPE with being able to, um, you know, supply um, the needs or meet the needs during crises and pandemics, you know, uh, that's one threat to the belief in which we should internationalize in terms of international trade. Um, the other one is, as the stimulus measures fade, as Bob mentioned, what happens to unemployment and then how does that manifest in terms of protectionism? So I think these are definitely open questions. Um, the enduring thing I'm quite sure, and actually I'm a little bit worried about uh, the possibility that goes too far, um, is the national security concern. It seems to be bipartisan, um, and, and I can see exactly the reasons why it might be something that uh, people in Washington, D.C. would be concerned about. Uh, on more broad terms of you know, multilateralism in trade institutions, so, you know, does the average person in the street really want us to get out of the WTO? Does he or she really care? Um, you know, are they you know, concerned about the arbitration mechanism and so forth? I, I don't think so. Um, and maybe the trade wars have demonstrated that we don't want to do anything too big. Um, so I leave that as an open question uh, about the future. I'm hopeful. Um, now, as to what will influence the Chinese, I think the the thing that uh, Scott men mentioned about um, hearing different messages from different people within the Chinese policy community, uh, it's reminiscent of the uh, currency manipulation debate. There's, uh, some people would say to you, this is second hand, uh, not to me, but some people would argue from China to American officials, I heard, well, don't say these things in public. Uh, that just makes it harder for us to implement anything. Other people would say, well, gee, you went so easy on us, we had no leverage internally to, to sort of push for greater uh, flexibility in, in the yuan's value. And so we, we hear, you know, it, it's not clear which way to proceed. One might almost say, gee, uh, if the U.S. can't go it alone to pressure the Chinese um, and it's possibly having backfire uh, effects, maybe we should have embarked upon a concerted effort with our allies to provide uh, big incentives to the Chinese to uh, engage in a way where they conform to our views more so on state-owned enterprises, on intellectual property rights. I think there was a name for that, it had three letters, uh, TPP maybe. Um, so the, the question then that I have for the other panelists, is there any appetite for anything more multilateral than we are embarking upon now, or at least less vociferously unilateral in, in trade policy? Uh, to me, um, what led to um, this whole trade war pre-COVID was not so much just Trump's um, distress at China's influence, but rather just a sort of visceral feeling that we weren't getting something out of the whole trade regime. Um, and maybe different perspectives will prevail after uh, November. That's my view. Thank you. Uh, thank you for posing that question to uh, Scott and Bob, and we'll see if they have any uh, uh, comments on it. Let me uh, let me just ask uh, one other question, which um, 
something that interests me and it builds upon my comment earlier about credit and China's growth. Um, you know, how, it's, it's, how do you see China's economy short and longer uh, term? Um, uh, you know, I've always thought that China needs to transition from investment to consumerism and services. Its financial system is vastly vulnerable and over levered. Um, the demographics are not favorable. And um, then you have author increased authoritarianism uh, on top of it. And I see this really as pulling China's sustainable growth rate down quite a bit over the next decade. Um, uh, you know, you've probably read uh, George Magnus's book um, and his red flags. Um, you know, I talked to David Dollar and he's written a book about what China can do to um, stay on a good, strong path. Um, so, so I guess I, I'd be curious just to hear your thoughts on where where you think um, the Chinese economy is headed, and you know maybe maybe in there you, if anybody any views about um, is there like a wall of money trying to get out of China, which if the capital controls leaked uh, could, and and this could also uh, kind of change the way we think about the Chinese, um, the RMB. Um, anyway, those are just a few questions. So I please speak to anything you would like, but I'm just keeping the feeding the fire here. Um, should we go in reverse order or, uh, oh, Let those guys go first. Scott, Scott is really big on reverse order. So Menzi, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks for, for get, lobbing me an easy set of questions. Um, let's see. Well, uh, comment so, on anything you want. <laughs> well, let me talk about longer term challenges for China, just to mention the obvious ones, uh, and then people can jump in to add or subtract. So uh, we knew that the Chinese growth, as best we could measure by a variety of statistical means, was slowing down, no matter whether you measured uh, using official statistics or you inferred by uh, other means indirectly the rate of growth. And the Chinese uh, policymakers obviously knew that. That's why they were on this concerted effort to figure out how to avoid the middle income trap. Um, and so I guess we're embarked upon a great experiment to see uh, whether you can retain you know, large amounts of control over at least a stable or perhaps increasing share of the economy being controlled by directly non-market means. That is, increasing role of state-owned uh, enterprises. Uh, as far as I can tell, there's no diminishment of that over the past few years. I mean, and that runs counter to you know most most of uh, what uh, mainstream economists would say is necessary that you need market signals to direct, uh, broadly speaking, where the economy goes. And I, I seem to see that uh, to me it seems the Chinese are embarked upon the approach that if I dump enough resources, dump enough money into strategic <laughs> sectors, that will do the trick. Um, so they've long ago seemingly given up on the idea that market, you know, greater market liberalization, use of let's say market signals uh, to to enhance productivity and growth, um, that's not the path. Uh, and uh, for better or for worse, um, I think the leadership is uh, pretty set upon that path. The other thing that uh, that uh, is relevant, I guess, is yes, growth has been somewhat sustained. Certainly, as Bob mentioned, China in the short term can maintain growth uh, more effectively because it controls so many more levers of the economy and society generally. But you know, the thing that we anybody who watches the Chinese economic policy making over time knows they're constantly saying we want to deleverage the economy either we want to get to some extent government debt particularly local government debt smaller or lower as a proportion of gdp or we want to make sure the financial sector is not over leveraged and yet you know each time a crisis hits uh, or even a semi-crisis a slowdown what you see is government debt has ratcheted over the past 20 years from essentially central government debt from zero to 55% or so. Um, and then the financial sector, either um, on balance or off balance sheet has gotten incredibly uh, more leveraged. And so it's a case where, yes, uh, maybe the intentions are there to figure out a way to grow without increased debt, but so far they, 
they haven't figured it out. And that seems to me the greatest threat over the medium term. They understand intellectually that there's a challenge uh, to growth coming from uh, from increasing debt, uh, but now uh, they're going to put that off because they have, quote unquote, a urgent crisis to, to meet. And it's done by government borrowing and indirectly borrowing through the financial sector that's mostly controlled or mainly controlled uh, by, by government intervention. So um, those two issues strike me as things that remain big questions before the pandemic and will retain, uh, remain something that's an that's, uh, issue they have to deal with. Fantastic. Bob? Uh, I don't understand. We reversed order and I'm still in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> You're always um, at the center. <laughs> so let me let me make three quick points. First, on Chinese growth, you know, almost certainly it will slow. Uh, demographics are clear. The China's population will be begin to decline at the end of the decade. The working age population is already declining and will decline faster. Uh, China's total productivity growth has since the global financial crisis has been half of what it was before. Something like 80% of Chinese economic growth is now accounted for by increased capital investment or increased capital stock. And the incremental capital output ratio has also, also doubled. Um, I don't see anything that's going on now that will lead to a reversal of, of that fact. Certainly the increased emphasis on state-owned enterprises, the increased emphasis on political control um, you know, all suggest lower productivity growth rather than more rapid productivity growth. Um, the second point is that I think Menzi is is absolutely correct on the hesitancy to delever once it begins to hurt. Uh, I want to expand a little bit on that because lots of people worry about, you know, isn't a financial crisis in China imminent? I think the answer to that question is no because financial crises, bank crises, don't happen from insolvency. They happen from lack of liquidity. And the Chinese government will be there to supply liquidity, i.e. increased credit, um, when and if uh, the time is necessary. And finally, on capital flight, I think there is, in fact, a lot of potential outward capital mobility from China. I think the extent to which the Chinese public is diversified internationally is quite low. Um, I think there's a considerable desire to diversify, basically to hedge against domestic political risk by Chinese wealthy families, by establishing foreign assets uh, and foreign family members in the United States, for example, with green cards, some uh, you know trap door in case things get bad in, in China. Um, so while I'm optimistic about China short term, I'm fairly pessimistic about China longer term. Well, thank you for that. Um, we are running out of time. So the last word goes to Scott Kennedy. Uh, well, I, I, I will then, given the shortness of time, uh, not give you my my take on the Chinese economy in any detail, only to say that um, we've predicted their demise so many times and they've uh, resolved each of them. I don't expect that uh, a guarantee, just like investments in the stock market, past performance doesn't guarantee future results. Uh, and uh, both uh, Menzi and Bob have identified a whole variety of risks and challenges uh, that the Chinese face. Uh, I would just go back to a question that you raised and others about what can we do? Uh, and what might be done. And, you know, I think, uh, yes, the, I think the Trump administration is starting to realize that there are other countries out there that they need to cooperate with to deal with China. They're sort of awoken to that. Uh, yet there, uh, and so you're seeing some kinds of sort of coordination where there's an agreement on on some idea and then an idea, to, and then try to plur, uh, multilateralize that. The Prague proposals dealing with trusted technologies in cyber is one such. But I think this administration still believes that the way you get more buy-in is to use U.S. leverage to push the heck out of everyone else. So that's why you see USMCA's Article 30 
that says any uh, if Canada or Mexico negotiate a, a, free, a deal with a non-market economy, they need U.S. approval. Same for the, the Mexicans and Canadians could do it to the U.S. as well. And if the U.S. doesn't approve, they could pull out a USMCA. That's one type of way uh, that they're, they're looking at. Another one that people ought to pay attention to called 5G Clean Path. The U.S. State Department is pushing the idea that every international uh, diplomatic uh, facility for the U.S. needs to be able to connect back to America over a network that is uh, trusted, no Chinese gear. U.S. DOD wants to do the same thing with uh, the uh, military installations. That kind of pressure, probably not going to work. Um, will we get something else? Well, perhaps, depending if the election turns out one way and, and Biden comes into office, you could see a return to multilateralism uh, traditionally. But I think, uh, particularly since a lot of folks uh, watching, uh, listening today are from Europe, uh, I think we're going to need two things from, from Europe to collaborate. Uh, one is uh, we're going to need to reach some agreement on issues that got nothing to do with China. Uh, we were negotiating TTIP, and there was lots of things holding that up. We're going to need to get back and sort of get rid of these disagreements that we have with each other um, and, and resolve those before we can face China. And the second is Europe's going to need to be able to use its own market power and leverage on China in ways that the Chinese don't like. And it's going to have to be explicit about that. Um, the uh, Europeans are having this week a summit with the Chinese, and they're talking tough, but they're not really acting tough. And for me, the number one thing the Europe could do to talk tough is to use the competition authority to launch a case against Huawei. That would be the biggest thing that they could do. It would send signals both to Beijing and Washington, and I think really change uh, the calculus on how we all interact with each other and create political space in Washington to be more collaborative and look for ways to re uh, solve some of these problems without just simply uh, screaming and hammering away at China. Well, thank you for that. And I'm, as Bob and I could tell you, um, uh, European nations have very different views about China and it's hard to really forge unity among the Europeans in addressing China. Um, but I thank all of you, uh, and I thank our audience for joining us, but I thank all of you for a fantastic uh, a panel today, very fascinating and interesting. Uh, thank you from OMFIF. Uh, have a good day. Thanks very much. Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody.